Ashish. I'll be talking about ML Toolkit. So let me start by saying that TensorFlow is this really amazing piece of technology. At Google, it's already powering systems ranging from search ranking, ads auction, YouTube recommendations, translate, photos, and many, many more. We can train complicated models with hundreds of billions of parameters and serve them on platforms ranging from mobile phones to cluster of TPUs. <coughs> However, TensorFlow is this <coughs> really low-level framework. And as Martin mentioned in an earlier talk, we are working on higher level primitives like layers, estimators, losses, and metrics to make it easier for researchers and developers to create custom model architectures. However, what's still missing from TensorFlow is algorithms that work out of the box. What a lot of developers really want is package solutions that they can quickly and easily integrate into their workflows. So I'm happy to tell you that now we have a toolkit of really popular machine learning algorithms that we have built right on top of TensorFlow. So starting with theory and logistic regression, k-means and Gaussian mixture models for unsupervised clustering of data, Wall's matrix factorization, which is a popular collaborative filtering algorithm for recommender systems, support vector machines, all the way to state-of-the-art algorithms like SDCA, stochastic dual coordinate ascent for convex optimization, random forests and decision trees, and various architectures of deep networks. Now, all these are available on GitHub, and we're constantly working on improving and expanding the set. Next, I'll highlight a few of these algorithms to give you a better sense of the existing and upcoming features for these algorithms. Starting with k-means. So here we implemented the standard Layard's iterative algorithm, along with random and k-means++ plus plus initialization. We support both full batch and mini batch training modes. And we also allow the user to specify distance functions like cosine or Euclidean square distances. Now, GMMs, on the other hand, model the data as a mixture of Gaussians. These are much more powerful models and also harder to train. For these, we use an iterative EM algorithm, and we allow the user to choose from a combination of means, covariances, mixture weights to train on. Next, we have walls, which is matrix factorization using weighted alternating least squares. Note I'll be revisiting this later in my talk as well. So here, you're given a very sparse matrix. For example, you could be given ratings that users have provided on videos. Note that the matrix is sparse, so not all the videos are being rated by each user. And now you want to answer questions like, which video should we recommend next to the user? Or to find user-user similarity or video-video similarity. Now, this is typically done by factorizing this huge matrix into a product of two factors, two dense factors. Note also that as the algorithm name indicates, this loss is weighted which allows you to, say, downweight things that were unrated in the original input, or to avoid uh, your spam or popular entries from drowning or the total loss. So this problem is highly non-convex. However, it turns out that if you fix one of the factors, there's a closed form analytical solution for the other factor. And so the training works in an iterative way, where you first fix v, uh, compute u, then fix u, compute v, and go on. Next, we have SVMs. So these work by finding a decision boundary that maximizes a margin. We are working with soft margin methods using a hinge loss. And the current implementation is of linear SVMs with L1 and L2 regularization. Note that SVMs becomes, become much more powerful with a nonlinear kernel, which allows a much more complicated decision boundary. So we are working on providing nonlinear kernels using the kernel approximation trick. Next, we have SDCA. Now here you have a convex loss function with L1, L2 regularization. And SDCA uses a neat trick of transforming this loss function into a dual form. And it turns out that for many problems, solving it in the dual form is much more efficient. And it turns out that this algorithm can power models from linear and logistic regression all the way to SVMs. We also have random forests and decision trees. Random forests are ensembles of decision trees. And decision trees work by creating a hierarchical partitioning of the feature space. Currently, our training method is what we call extremely random forest training, which allows better parallelization and scaling. And we're also working on having gradient boosted decision trees, which are very, very popular also. So I talked about the different algorithms. Now we want to make it really, really easy for users to use them. All of these are exposed via very high level scikit-learn inspired estimator APIs. Here's an example for how one might do k-means clustering. So you start by creating a k-means clustering object. 
And here you can pass in a bunch of options, like the number of clusters, how you want to train, how you want to initialize, and so on. Next, you call the fit function and pass it your input. And that's it. Now TensorFlow goes behind the scenes. It creates the graph for you. It will run training iterations, configure the runtime till the training is done. When you're finally ready, you can start inspecting the model parameters, like the clusters, and start running inference, here finding the assignment to clusters, and so on. So I talked about high-level APIs, but you also want to maintain the flexibility and extensibility that TensorFlow promises. So these are not opaque objects that are only accessible via this API. We, in fact, allow the users to inspect the graphs and also to be able to embed these graphs into larger training models. So here's a, training, here's a toy example that embeds k-means as a layer in a, in a bigger, deeper network. You start with an input. You run k-means and get your graph for k-means. It also returns your training op to drive the clustering. And the output is the input transformed to a distance to cluster space. Next, you feed this to your dense stack of layers. You create your supervised loss. You run SGD to get a final drain in training op. Now you have these two training ops. You can join them to create a single training op that can drive the co-training of these two models. Here's a code snippet for the same. So you start by creating this k-means object, and you inspect the training graph. It returns you a training op and the output. Next, you feed your output into dense layers, and you create your model architecture as usual. Finally, you get a training op to drive your supervised loss or your, your dense stack. And finally, you use TensorFlow's group operation to, to group together these ops so that you have a single op to drive the code training. So just to recap the talk so far, I talked to you about the different algorithms that are available now. I showed you examples for how to use high-level APIs to access them, and also talked about flexibility and extensibility of these algorithms. Next, I want to highlight the fact that all these algorithms are backed by distributed implementations. Just to give you a better sense of the complexity hidden behind these few lines of Python code, I'll dig deeper into the implementation of one of the algorithms. So in general, the, the distribution architecture is going to be the same. You will have a set of parameter servers, which will store all the parameters in a sharded way. You will have a bunch of worker replicas that will be running training steps with many batches of inputs. In each step, the worker replica would fetch some parameters. It will run compute on the input to compute the new value of the parameters. And finally, it will write back these updates to the parameter server. So let's look at walls again. So just to recap, walls, with walls, you want to factorize a really sparse matrix into dense factors. And as I told you, the training algorithm involves fixing one of the factors, computing the other one, and iterating. Now we want to be able to scale to inputs that are terabytes in size. And we want factors that have hundreds of millions of rows and hundreds of columns. So how do we, how do, how do we make this work? <coughs> so we have to carefully think about all the RAM, compute, and network bottlenecks. So the first obvious thing is, given the size of these factors, you will have to distribute them across parameter server shards. So you take your use, split them across all these shards. Next thing, given the amount of compute involved, you want a bunch of worker replicas. The sharding scheme that we use for these worker replicas is row slicing. What that means is each mini batch is a subset of rows of the input, and we compute the corresponding rows of U. Note, however, there is still a problem. Each update to U depends on the full V factor. And as I said, V could be large, it could be terabytes. So what this entails is that you might be copying terabytes of data to each worker in each step. So how do you get around that? So at this point, we use some linear algebra magic. It turns out you can compute certain summaries, let's call them G, and given G, your updates to U only depend on a few rows of V. And these are specifically the rows that correspond to the non-zero entries of the input. So this is great. Uh, what that means is that instead of copying terabytes, you can just copy megabytes of data per step. So at this point, we can run TensorFlow's gather operation and get the required rows. We run compute using highly optimized custom C++ kernels that we wrote. And finally, we use TensorFlow scatter operation to write back these updates to the parameter server shards. So how well does this work? We believe our implementations are really high performance. We did some benchmarking, and on single machine, our implementations in general look on par with Scikit in terms of model quality and speed, often even working faster for moderate size problems as well. 
But where TensorFlow really shines is being able to run seamlessly across hundreds of thousands of machines. In fact, in many cases, we were able to train models that were much larger than what we had seen in literature. For example, with Random Forest, we were able to train thousands of trees with billions of nodes. And we have a paper in NIPS that talks about that. With SDCA, we saw 10 to 50x faster convergence compared to Google's highly optimized internal coordinate descent based implementations on logistic regression for data sets with billions of examples. With walls, we were able to factorize a huge matrix, 400 million rows by 600 million columns, into factors with 500 columns in under 12 hours. Note that this is 50x larger than what we could do with an earlier map reduce based implementation. So in summary, we have really high performance, distributed, and extensible implementations of different ML algorithms that are working out of the box in TensorFlow. These bring together the ease of scikit with the power and scalability of TensorFlow, and moves TensorFlow one step closer to being a more complete ML solution. I'm hoping at this point you guys are excited to get started. So here are some links to code and documentation. And here are a bunch of estimators that are ready to use. With that, thank you. Thank you.